circulated that there was going to be an agreement between the overseers of a workhouse and the owner of a great cotton mill. The children were told that when they arrived at the cotton mill, that they would be transformed into ladies and gentlemen. That they would be fed on roast beef and plum pudding and have plenty of cash in their pockets. In August 1799, 80 boys and girls who were seven years old became parish apprentices till they had acquired the age of 21. The young strangers were conducted into a spacious room with long narrow tables and wooden benches. The supper set before them consisted of milk porridge of a very blue complexion. Where was our roast beef and plum pudding? That was the con played on eight-year-old Robert Blinko, who was told to a journalist several years later. He was bound apprentice to a spinning mill like this one. This is Quarry Bank Mill in Cheshire, founded in 1780. It was built out in the sticks because it needed the river that runs through the valley to power the machines inside. The downside of that decision was that remote places like this were low on available manpower. So who would staff these mills? Who would do the work? The solution was to recruit the most vulnerable elements in society, orphans. The first wave of factory labor in this country was made up of orphans. They were the real-life Oliver Twists, left to the mercy of the parishes. And their employment was nothing less than state-sponsored slavery. They were called parish apprentices and aged as young as seven or eight, were taken by cart from their homes in the parishes of London and other towns and cities and transported hundreds of miles away to places like this. On arrival, they would be piled into dormitories like this one, billeted near their workplaces and indentured to the mills and factories as apprentices. Once signed over, they had to stay here till they were 21, sometimes 24 years old. State-of-the-art machinery shook and pounded the walls of these mills from dawn till dusk, and all the while, children kept time with the relentless beat. So Chris, how many people would be working this machine? Typically, uh, two men and a young child to a pair. The machine that we have here represents only half of that pair. Yes. Was it dangerous? Oh, yeah. Injuries generally always occurred in the last two hours of the day. So, injuries happen when people lost concentration? Yeah, yeah. I see over here in this picture, the boy's not wearing any shoes. No, uh, you weren't allowed to work. Your clogs, which were that foot period, footwear of that, that period, you weren't allowed to wear them simply because with these machines running all the time, you get a level of cotton dust that builds up on the floor almost as if it's been snowing. Yeah. And obviously with your clogs, if your clog iron was to catch the railing on the floor, possibility of a spark oh, yeah. and you would set fire to the to the you yeah, know, factory dangerous. floor, you'd burn the mill down. So yeah. mule room work was always barefooted. Yeah. Parish apprentices were often called pauper apprentices because the new factories provided the powers that be with a cheap way of dealing with poor children. Work became a substitute for social welfare. Many children went off to their apprenticeship, whether it was factory or elsewhere, quite excited yes. at the possibility of becoming, um, you know, an independent worker, learning a skill. They had regular meals, mm. even if they weren't great. Yes. Um, they got education, you know, and they had a, a roof over their heads. Mm. But right from the start, they would be working 14 or 15 hours a day, sometimes more, with the possibility of, of overtime, um, for which they might get a little, mm. a little money. Otherwise, they weren't paid. Mm -hmm. 